Well, it's a great privilege. It's a great privilege for me to be here with you uh, this evening. And um, whenever I first come to a place, no matter where it is, whether it's Europe, South America, Africa, the most important message that I have to bring is the gospel of Jesus Christ. His gospel. Now, when I say that, we have to be very, very careful. Why? Because we live in a day and an age where the gospel of Jesus Christ has been reduced down to almost nothing. People think of the gospel as this, this thing they learn in five or ten minutes, and then they go on to greater things. And when you understand the New Testament, you understand that that is completely false. That most people today, even within the church, do not understand the gospel as it is presented in the Bible. They also do not understand the gospel as our forefathers in the faith understood the gospel. To give you an illustration of how profound the gospel is, just listen to this. You know, so many people today are talking about the second coming, and they want to know all about the book of Revelation and the second coming. And that's important because it is in the Bible. But you're going to know everything about the second coming on the day that Jesus comes. On the day that Jesus comes, you're going to understand the second coming. But you're going to be in eternity in heaven and you are still not going to fully comprehend the glory of God as it is revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not four spiritual laws or five things God wants you to know. The gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be contained in some little five-page track. The gospel of Jesus Christ is greater than eternity. You know... There is a philosophical question that's very important to answer whenever we talk about eternity. We know that eternity is not, not just an infinite length of time, but that eternity is a quality of life. But we also understand that eternity is a long, long time. Now, many people in their Christian songs today want to sing about streets of gold and gates of pearl and how wonderful heaven will be. But even streets of gold and gates of pearl are going to get boring after a few hundred years. I mean, one of the philosophical questions that you have to answer when you talk about eternity is what is going to keep us all from going mad? I mean, think about it. Infinite existence, ongoing existence. Well, I'm going to tell you what's going to keep us from going mad. It's not that heaven is a perfect place. That's not going to keep us content. It's not that there are streets of gold and gates of pearl. Eternity will be a discovery of an infinite God. And no, long, no matter how long eternity may be, we will never exhaust the glory and the beauty and the splendor of God. And that glory and that beauty is primarily revealed in what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. If we were to say there were days and nights in heaven, and of course we know nothing about that, but if we were to say that, it would be something like this. You enter into heaven... And you see God as you have never seen Him before. You see the gospel and what God has done for you in Christ as you have never seen it before. And if it wasn't for the strengthening of God, the beauty and the glory of the entire thing would destroy you. It would, make you, it would drive you mad. Your brain, your mind could not contain it. And then you go to bed. And then you get up in the morning. And you see another vision of God in Christ that far surpasses the day before so that if you were not strengthened it would literally drive you mad it would explode your intellect it would destroy your heart it is a glory too big and it will be all of eternity 
tracking down this infinite glory, discovering this infinite beauty, all the excellencies and virtues of God that are manifest most greatly in the person of Jesus Christ and his cross and resurrection and what he has obtained for us through these things. So you see, in contemporary Christianity, especially much of what comes out of America that has corrupted many, many nations. You have a gospel about prosperity. You have a, a gospel about an easy life. You have a gospel that has been dumbed down so that carnal men will enjoy it. All of that is one of the greatest crimes that have ever been committed against a holy God. To take the gospel and make it something it's not. To take the gospel and take all the glory out of it. To repackage the gospel so that carnal men will want it is a crime. And as I've said many times, the Apostle Paul would have rather stretched forth his hand and touched the ark of God and died than he would have changed one word of the gospel. Now here's the question. Most of you here, or probably, if not all of you, believe yourself to be Christian. And that may be true. But here's the question. Do you understand the gospel? Do you see its glory? Because if you have, you want nothing else. As I told some prosperity fellow, a guy talking about prosperity a while back, I do not care if I end my life crippled, starving, and rotting in prison. As long as I have the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's all the glory I need. The gospel. So, we're going to look at the gospel in the times that I preach here in Norway. And we're going to begin by looking at certain passages that just demonstrate to us the importance of the gospel. So I want you to go, first of all, to the book of Romans. Chapter 1. Verse 14. Paul says, for I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now verse 14, to begin with, understand who is the Apostle Paul. He is an apostle, one of the twelve, one of those appointed, God's ambassador in a very, very unique and special way. Although there are many people today claiming to be apostles, they are silly, silly little boys playing religion and that's all they are. We have apostles, they're in the New Testament, they are the twelve and they are the foundation of the church of which Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. There's not another foundation. We have these men. The most, you realize this, these are the most important men in all of human history. Even Spurgeon himself said, if someone asked me, to, I'm a preacher, he said, I'm a carrier of the gospel. I would never lower myself to be a king. Now, if Spurgeon can say that, how much do we recognize this about the apostles? The most important men in human history. Remember what he said of all women, John was the greatest born, but the smallest in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Here we have these men. 
and they are given a task. They have been tested by God according to 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 2. They have been tested by God and entrusted with what? Not a message. The gospel is not a message in Christianity. The gospel is the message in Christianity. It is the Alpha and the Omega message of Christianity. You must understand this. And you also must understand this. That although the gospel is found on every page of the Bible, not every message of the Bible is the gospel. The gospel is a very specific message. And it centers around the redemptive work of God in Christ when Jesus went to a tree and died for the sins of his people and rose again from the dead. And explaining all that that means. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the most important men in history were given the most important message in history. It is the gospel. And Paul said he was under obligation or a debtor. He was called by God to preach this gospel to every man. And he was indebted to every man. Because regardless of what you think about the sovereignty of God, no one is getting saved apart from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no one is going to believe apart from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul saw himself not as a man resting in sovereignty and just laying back and doing nothing. He saw himself as a debtor with a message that was urgent, a message that had to be preached to every creature under heaven. Do you see that? Urgent was he. He wasn't urgent to teach them about how to heal. He wasn't urgent to teach them about prosperity. He wasn't urgent to teach them about how they could have their best life now. He was urgent to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this message was the most precious message to Paul. To the point that he would tell people, I don't care to know anything about you. Except Jesus Christ. And Him crucified. Now, isn't it amazing when we look at this and then we look at most of these very popular TV preachers and evangelists. You could go for months listening to them and not once hear a clear communication of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet for the true man of God, the gospel is everything. It's what he thinks about. It's what he yearns for, to understand in a greater way the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Now, if, if you're here and you're a Christian, you also are under obligation. You're under obligation to know this gospel so that when you open up your mouth to tell somebody about God, the gospel, the biblical gospel, comes out. Do you realize there's more missionary activity going on in the world today? than in any other time of Christian history, and a great part of it is absolutely worthless. It's worthless. Because the Great Commission is primarily a theological, doctrinal, didactic endeavor. It's about opening up our mouth and preaching the gospel. And knowing it to be able to explain it. Because those of us who have the gospel must not only be proclaimers, we must be scribes. We must be men who can not only proclaim it, but can sit down and explain it clearly, point by point, to those who gather around the gospel that's been proclaimed. Now he says, to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. Now, He's not only saying that he must preach this gospel universally, but here's something else. When Paul went to a wise man, he preached the gospel. And when Paul went to a fool, he preached the gospel. And when Paul went to a Jew, he preached the gospel. And when Paul went to a pagan, he preached the gospel. And he didn't change it. He didn't repackage it. He didn't try to shape it in such a way to make it more understandable or even easier to swallow. Don't change the gospel. 
You, ch you change one letter of the gospel. You repackage the gospel to make it fit our culture or your culture. And guess what? Galatians chapter 1 says you're anathema. That you're under a curse. This message is not to be changed. Yet most of the ideas coming out of the West, America and out of Europe, is doing what? They would never be bold enough to say that they've changed the gospel, but they're all bold enough to say that they're repackaging it for modern man, or repackaging it for the Muslim, or repackaging it for the Hindu. No! You preach the same gospel to everyone. To everyone. Now let's go on. Verse 15, so for my part, Paul's saying for me, and what he's talking about is, is this, this encounter that he's had with Christ, this encounter that he's had with the gospel that has changed him so completely. I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Prior to this man's conversion, he would have nothing to do with a Gentile. Nothing to do. Gentile was a dog. A Gentile was outside the covenant. He would be eager to pronounce maybe condemnation upon the Gentile. But now he's eager to go and preach the gospel to the Gentile. And he says this, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. My dear friend, there are many good reasons for our flesh to be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel goes against flesh it goes against human pride it goes against the intellect now I want you to think for just a moment just I want you to see that the gospel truly must be the power of God unto salvation because if it wasn't, there's no way it would have made it past the first century. Now I want you to think about this. We've got the Roman Empire. Caesar is Lord. The Roman Empire is filled, filled, utterly filled with gods. Hundreds of gods, thousands of gods, all kinds of gods. And most of these gods, all of them, were according to the flesh. They were. They tantalized the flesh. That's why you saw statues of these beautiful women or statues of these beautiful strong men, these godlike figures. It was all according to the flesh. It was strong. It was proud. It was intellectual. And here comes this little Jew by the name of Paul. Now, now think about this for a moment. He comes in to a group, let's say even an auditorium, a gathering place of philosophers. And as they're all talking, knowing that their own people, their own culture was one of the highest that the world had ever known. And after Paul sits there and listens to him for a minute, he goes like this. Um, can I say something? And they look and here's this Jew. Yeah, what do you want? Uh, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. You're wrong about everything. You're wrong in every way. Every letter of every word you have spoken is wrong. Your culture's wrong. Your reality is completely wrong. Now here's one little Jewish man standing against the most intellectual culture that had been known. The most classical, the most powerful, and he stands there in front of all of them and he says, you're wrong about everything. Now, let me say this, maybe it'll help you understand it. Do you know one of the reasons why Christians were persecuted in the Roman Empire? They were persecuted for being atheists. You say, what, what are you talking about? No, Christians were persecuted for being atheists. Because Christians said all the gods of Rome, the Hellenistic, the Greek world, all the gods that you have are no gods at all. They don't exist. 
You see, here's the thing. If Paul had done like some of these preachers today and walked in and said, hey, I've got an option for you. I've got another Savior you might want to consider. If Paul had referred to Jesus as a Savior, a God, among the other gods, no Christian would have ever died. Do you realize that? Everybody would have been happy. And isn't it the same today? I could go on any talk show in America, and if I was willing to say that Jesus is a Savior, no one would have a problem with me at all. No one. They would all embrace me. It's when I walk in there and say, no, not an indefinite article, but a definite article. He is not a Savior. He is the Savior. And apart from Him, there is no other Savior. Do you realize how ludicrous that sounds to the world? What a bigot I look like. How proud I am when I say that. I mean, everybody's having a good time with all their gods. They're changing gods. They're swapping gods. They're doing all kinds of things. Everybody's having a good time. And then the Christian shows up and said, all your gods are false. All of them. Do you see how people would rail against that? How they would attack it? How Paul would have right in his flesh to almost be ashamed to say it, but he had to say it. Why? It was true. It was true. And then I want you, let, let's say that all these philosophers turn and look at Paul and they go, okay, you know, just for a good time, let's listen to this guy. I mean, this is hilarious. So Paul goes, they, they ask Paul, they say, okay, well, tell us about the true God. Well, the true God is the maker of the heavens and the earth. Okay. And all men have rebelled against him. All men have violated his law in every way. Even to this point, the philosophers would be hanging on. The moralists would be hanging on, listening to him. And Paul said, though, to reconcile man to himself, God became a man. If there's anything in Greek philosophy you never want to say, it's that. You never want to say that because one of their primary rules is spirit and matter don't mix. The material and the spiritual do not come together. God becoming man is about the most absurd thing you could have ever said to a Greek mind. And to a Jewish mind, it was the most blasphemous thing you could ever say. So they're going, <laughs> God became a man. But they're going to keep listening. So they say, well, well, you know, who was he? I mean, where did this happen? Well, it happened in Palestine. Okay, so God decides to come to earth and he just happens to pick the most despised place in the world to do it. He doesn't choose Rome. He doesn't choose Sparta. He doesn't choose any place. In, he chooses Palestine. Yes. Okay, well, uh, so I guess he's the king of the Jews. He came down and you Jews have him now. He's king. He was born royal lineage. He, he well... He was, he was born in, in, in Nazareth. Really? This just keeps getting better. And, 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 and what happened? How did it happen? He was born to a virgin. Can you imagine? Think about that. All these philosophers, look at... He, yeah, right. He was born <laughs> to a virgin. Right. Okay, so, um, but I guess she was of the royal, you know, royal household. Well, actually, no... His, uh, her husband was a carpenter. So God becomes a man the one time in human history. He comes to the most despised place in the world and he's born to a virgin who is married to a carpenter. Yes. Okay, what else? Well, he lived a perfect life. And then he went to the cross. He went to a cross. Even, even the Romans will not crucify another Roman citizen on a cross. And you're saying God becomes a man. And then, having lived a perfect life in your own country with your own people, they all nail him to a Roman cross. Yes. 
And what did this holy God do on the cross? He became sin. And he died. And he rose again on the third day. And the philosophers maybe say, well, and I suppose all of Israel saw this. Well, no, actually only about 500 witnesses ever saw him alive. Out of all those people? Yes, out of all those people. And where is he now? Could you show him to us? No, um, he ascended up into heaven. Oh, and, and by the way, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is. Now, do you see why Paul says I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Because his flesh, his flesh had a lot of reasons to back off on some of these truths because to the world he lived in, they were ludicrous. Now, we hear preachers today, and what are they doing? They're backing off on these truths. Why? Because they say modern man can't accept them. Man has never been able to accept the gospel. But the fact that they do accept the gospel and the fact that everywhere Paul went, including when he was with the philosophers, some of them followed him out and became disciples is proof that this is a supernatural message and it is accompanied by the supernatural regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And that God saves men through it. He wasn't ashamed of it. One of the things that we need to understand, especially those men who want to adapt the gospel to make it more acceptable to modern culture, is that the gospel has never been acceptable to any culture. It wasn't acceptable to the Jewish culture, to the Roman culture, to the barbarian culture. But through the power of God, many believe and are saved. And the more we hold to that message, the more we're going to see the power of God. And the more we're ashamed and walk away from that message and do not make that message front and center, the less we're going to see the power of God. Young man, if you're thinking about going in the ministry, you listen to me right now. The world doesn't need another clever man. The world doesn't need another pretty man. The world doesn't need another strategist. But a man who has the word of God in his hand, his heart, and his mouth, and has bloody knees from intercession, and will boldly proclaim this message without changing one jot or tittle, that's what the world needs. That's what it needs. I am so tired of all these little boys wanting to play church. You decide whether you're going to be a strategist, a comedian, an entertainer, or a man of God. If you're going to be a man of God, then strip yourself of all of Saul's armor and pick up the smooth stones of the gospel and go out there and slay Goliath, this culture, with the preaching of God's word. And another thing, many people say today, I hear it all the time, I am not a person who is street preaching like our brother Tony all the time. I have done it, will do it again, but it's not a major part of my ministry. But I have a great respect for street preachers. And everybody tells me, no, the culture won't accept street preaching. Or do you never study history? The culture has never accepted street preachers. Never. Will they lampoon them and laugh at them? Yes, have you ever seen pictures of Whitfield, drawings of Whitfield? Horrible things they said about him. Jonathan Edwards, just Wesley's, on and on. The Apostle Paul. When he came to the church in Thessalonica, and then the accusers came and tried to accuse him and break that church up, he said, you know we're men of integrity, and you know our message was true, because you know that we suffered in Philippi. Now how can he say that when the Thessalonians were not in Philippi? How is it that they knew that he suffered in Philippi? Because when he left Philippi and came to Thessalonica, his back was bleeding. His head and face were swollen. His ankles and feet were so swollen from being in the stocks. No one has ever accepted the gospel. But when it is preached clearly and biblically, and when men are praying and the Spirit of God is moving, there is manifested its power and men will be saved. 
men will be saved. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. I have been a missionary in the foreign field, the jungles. And yes, I have seen at times God do amazing things. Yes, God can still do miracles today. He can. But if you ever come to me talking about miracles and all these types of things, you will see me yawn. I've seen miracles. I've been in the jungle. I've seen God do miraculous things. None of those things are demonstrations of his power, like the salvation of one soul through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't talk to me about miracles. They're little things. Talk to me about the power of God revealed through the crucified and resurrected Jesus. That's what I want to hear. But most people don't want to hear that today. They'd rather watch some circus sideshow evangelist doing all kinds of hokey things that aren't true than they would rather hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. Let us have a conference next year in, in Norway. A conference for signs and wonders and your best life now. And we'll fill up the biggest auditorium you've got. But then let us have a conference on what it means that Jesus Christ died for our sins. You'd be lucky to get 200 people. Men don't want Christ. Many preachers don't want Christ. And they know nothing about his power the power, the great power of God is revealed in the gospel. In the gospel. In Jesus and what he did. And that has to be just foremost in our heart and foremost in our head when we get up in the morning, when we go to bed at night. Christ crucified and raised. And it is in that message that great power is revealed. The moral corruption of a man goes beyond anything that any of us could ever describe. The heart of a man is like Jericho. It is, shite, it, is, it is tightly shut up and no one comes in and no one goes out. In the same way that Israel with all their soldiers could not knock down that wall of Jericho. We cannot knock down the wall of sin around the human heart. We cannot. We can't with all our missionary strategies. We can't save one soul. It is a work of God through the Holy Spirit. And it is most manifest when men are preaching the gospel. And that's the great miracle. When you see drug addicts set free. When you see prostitutes made pure. When you see greedy businessmen turn into generous and kind men who are concerned about the welfare of the world. When you see men that could never be a father become great fathers. That's power. That is power. And I find it interesting that most of the people who are most given to all these signs and wonders and everything else also happen to be some of the most immoral people that ever walked on the planet and their preachers fall by the dozens. The power of God in the gospel. And he says here, for it is the power of God for salvation. Do not think that he is just talking about salvation from condemnation. Do not think that. I want you to look at salvation in three tenses and the gospel is preeminent in all three tenses. One, if you are a Christian, you have been saved from the condemnation of sin. And the gospel does that. Saves you from the condemnation of sin. But the gospel that saves us from the condemnation of sin is also now saving us from the power of sin. Through the gospel, we're becoming more and more sanctified, more free from sin, more like Christ, less like the world. And then one day, through this glorious gospel, we will be completely in and everywhere saved as we stand before God in glorified bodies.
The gospel is the power of God for salvation. And it doesn't just mean you've got a ticket to heaven and you'll continue living an ungodly life. That's not what it means. But the ones who have been saved by the gospel, by faith, are also transformed by the gospel and grow in the gospel so that they become more holy. In other words, the evidence of justification is sanctification. We know we are saved because he who began a good work in us continues working and we continue responding by the grace of God. It saves us. It saves us. How do, just personally, how, how do I want the gospel to save me? I know that it has saved me from hell. I know that I'm a child of God. But why do I study the gospel and read the gospel? Well, first of all, because I find great glory in it. But there's another reason. I don't care if I ever walk on water. I don't care if I ever do any miracle. I want to be free from sin. And I want to love my wife as I ought to, and love my children as I ought to, and love my brothers and sisters as I ought to. I want to stop being full of self, and I want to be full of Christ. I want to empty my life for others. I want to be a Christian. I want to be clean. I want to be blameless and innocent. That's how I want to see God's power manifested in my life through the gospel. Now, theology is extremely important. Don't get me wrong, young men. And I talk about theology a lot. I teach theology. But sometimes I hear young men in a, just a tremendous theological battle going back and forth. And I walk by and they go, Brother Paul, what do you think about this? And I go, well, I really don't think about that. I'm just trying to love my wife. I want to be clean. I know I'm clean through his blood, but in my daily activity, I want to be clean. I want to be pure. I want to have good thoughts, even about my enemies. I want to be like Christ. I don't want to go through that other door and chase all those silly little trinkets. I want the gold, which is conformity to my master. And that's what Paul said, didn't he, in, in Philippians? He was pressing on. He was pressing on, what? To this high call of what? Being like Christ. Being pleasing to the Father. So he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Here's the thing that I want you to see that's very, very deadly. The gospel saves everyone who believes. Now, what do I mean by that? Sometimes, th well, there is a truth. It is true that Christians who are saved, genuine Christians, grow at different speeds and in different ways. We've all seen men in history and even in our own life that have been converted and they just seem to shoot like a rocket and grow. It's wonderful. We see other believers that struggle a lot more. We don't understand that, but in the providence of God and in the scriptures, we've seen it. We've seen it. It's true. There are strong and there are weak. And so, so I don't want to take anything away from that. That's true. But here's something that we need to be very careful about. Even the weakest saint is going to grow. Even the weakest saint is going to experience salvation. Not just condemnation. Not just freedom from condemnation, but also gradual greater freedom from the power of sin to walk a more holy life. It's very possible that many people in this room that are so far beyond me in their spirituality and in their conformity to Christ. Now that doesn't, that doesn't make me feel bad. I rejoice for them and it also encourages me that I can grow. But looking at my own life, as little maybe as I have changed, I know over the last 30 years that I have changed. That I am not the same man that I was that day he met me in the library of the University of Texas. The day the Lord saved me there. I'm a different man. So there's not just these special believers who, who really do get changed and then everybody else is a true carnal believer. That's not true. 
He begins and finishes His work in everyone who truly believes. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Any man, every man. So that they are going to change. And he says, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, what have we learned from all of this? We know this, the gospel was preeminent in the life of Paul. And one of the ways, dear Christian, that you can tell if a man is a man of God, he will give preeminence to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though he will teach morality, his, his preaching will be much more than, rea than, than morality or ethics. It will be the gospel. Every time he opens his mouth, if he's teaching on marriage, if he's teaching on holiness, if he's teaching on prayer, fasting, anything, he's going to make the gospel first place. First place. Everything he's going to encourage the believer to do will grow out of the gospel and into the gospel. It's all about the gospel. You're going to see in the true man of God when you look at him that his joy is the gospel. What God has done for us in Christ. But if you see a man come along that he's about so many other things and he treats the gospel as well, that's baby food. I've gone on to greater stuff. Run from that man. Run from him. Run from him. Now, let's go a little bit farther. Let's move over now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand. Now, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Do you notice how so many people believe the gospel is for lost people? You preach the gospel to people in evangelism, and then you go from there. And you never talk about the gospel again. Look what Paul's talking. Look what, look what he's saying. He's talking to brethren. He's talking to brothers. He had shared the gospel with them. He had preached the gospel to them. And now he's coming back and what is he doing? He's making known the gospel to them again. And what does that teach us? That the greatest means of growing in sanctification is greater and greater knowledge of what God has done for us in Christ. And that if we're going to maintain what we've already gained in sanctification, we must not depart from the gospel and go on to something new, but hold on to the old. Hold on to the same gospel. Hold on to Christ. So he says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. Now, now, brothers, I believe that Christians ought to be charitable, I believe that we can do good works. I believe that we should do good works. I believe that we should help people. But no one's going to get saved unless someone opens up their mouth and preaches. An old Catholic saint one time said, preach the gospel always, use words when necessary. That has a kernel of truth in it, but it basically contradicts the apostolic ministry. So, look, I have a friend who works in a country that is totally off limits. It's a Muslim country. It's totally off limits. And he is a true missionary. He preaches the gospel. He preaches the gospel. But he told me, he said, when I got to my neighborhood, there was a missionary who had been there before me for many, many, many years. And he said, everybody in the neighborhood said he was the nicest guy in the world. That he, all the Muslims said he was the nicest, kindest man. All they could do is talk about how good he was. And none of those people knew anything about Jesus because that man never opened his mouth. If you're going to be a missionary and you think you're going to go over there just by being nice to people and you're going to do something, please don't waste your time or the church's money. You must open up your mouth and preach. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Everybody loves the Christian. When he's teaching them about prosperity. Or teaching them how to be a nice guy. Or teaching them how to love their wife. Or teaching them how to do a miracle. 
But when you open up your mouth and say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him, and all the other gods are no gods at all, and the prophets before Him and after were all false, Amen. that's when you get crucified. But no one's getting saved unless you open up your mouth and preach. If I could take you right now to the first two chapters of 1 Thessalonians that I've been studying for my own church. It's every, every, almost in every verse, Paul's either saying speaking, preaching, speaking, preaching, speaking, preaching. That was the apostolic ministry. It was to preach. Here's another thing that makes that very important that will help you. I had a young man call me years ago when I was in Peru and he said, Brother Paul, he goes, I want to come down to Peru and work with you. I said, great. How are you, how are you in your scripture study? He goes, well, that's really not, you know, that's not my strong area. I just want to come down and give my life away. And I said, well, how are you in, in uh, preaching? He said, well, you know, that's just not my thing. I just want to come down there and give my life away. And I said, well, how are you in intercessory prayer? He said, well, intercessory prayer is not really my thing. I just want to come down there, the mission field, and give my life away. And I said, young man, there is no one in Peru who needs your life. They need Jesus, and they need someone who can open up their mouth and tell them about Jesus. If we were just a people for the last 2,000 years walking around doing nice things to people, no one would have killed any of us. But we've been slaughtered for the last 2,000 years. Why? Because we open up our mouth and we say the world is wrong. And that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that He's the only way. Now we should not seek to be offensive. We should not be bitter, angry, spirited people. But we must open up our mouth and tell them the truth. And if we do it, even though we are kind people, they will call us angry, mean-spirited people who don't love anyone. But that's part of the scandal of being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he says, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received. Let me tell you what this does not mean. Let me tell you right now what this does not mean. What America has promoted throughout all the nations of the world. Now that I have taken a minute and a half and shared with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, would you like to pray right now and open up your heart and ask him to come in? That's not what he's... Would you like to receive Jesus through this prayer? That is not what this means. <clears throat> Great majority of people in America are going to hell thinking they're saved because one time in their life they prayed a little prayer and asked Jesus to come in. You are not saved by praying a little prayer and asking Jesus to come in. You are saved by repentance and faith. Not by some empty little creed. Just think about the way evangelism is done. So he walks up to somebody and say, do you know you're a sinner? And the person goes, yes. And they go on to the next question. That person has no idea what he's saying when he says he knows he's a sinner. And even if he acknowledges he's a sinner, that doesn't matter. That means nothing. Go ask the devil if he's a sinner. He will say, yes, I am a sinner. Not, we know nothing when a person tells us he's a sinner. Why? Because today men boast about sin. They brag about sin. They see who can be the biggest sinner. It doesn't mean anything if someone tells you, yes, I know I'm a sinner. Because the question is not, do you know you're a sinner? The question is this. Now that you've heard the gospel, has the Holy Spirit so worked in your heart that the sin you were loving you now hate? And the sin you were boasting about, you're now ashamed of. And the sin that you was clinging to, you now want to be free from. That's the question. But if the person says, yes, I would like, uh, I, I'm a sinner. Then they go on to the next question. Would you like to go to heaven? Who's ever said, no, I would rather go to hell, honestly. 
You see, here's what you need to understand. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Every, that's what political theory is about. That's what philosophy is about. That's what social reconstructuring is all about. Everybody either wants to go to heaven or create a heaven here on earth. Everyone wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. So the question is not, do you want to go to heaven? The question is, do you want God? Since you have heard the gospel, has the Holy Spirit so worked in your life that the God that you did not love, you now love? And the God you did not seek, you now desire to seek and know? That's the question. And then the question is not, would you like to pray this prayer and ask Jesus to come in? As a matter of fact, it's not a question at all. It's an apostolic command. Then repent and believe the gospel. And if they show fruits of repentance, signs of repentance, and signs of faith, and they say, I've repented, I believe, don't discourage them. Say, wonderful, if you have truly repented, and if you have truly believed, you have been saved, but then warn them. Here will be the evidences. If you have been genuinely converted, you will continue walking with him. You will continue believing. The evidence that you repented 20 years ago is that you're still repenting today. The evidence that you believed unto salvation 20 years ago is you are still believing today. It's not, I got a flu shot. I got a vaccination. Now I'm okay. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. What does it mean to receive? It's to open our life to Him. All of Him. There's a teaching in the United States that in order to be saved, you must receive Jesus as Savior, but not Lord. Hold your place for just a second. I want to show you something. Go to Romans chapter 10. The same people who say that you, must, you can receive Jesus as Savior and not Lord are the same people who use Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 out of context. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now look, confess Him as Savior? No, confess Him as Lord. What did He say in Matthew 7? Many have said to me, Lord, Lord. Not those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Here's what I want you to see. That when we receive Jesus, we receive him as Savior and we receive him as Lord. We receive all of him. Someone told me one time, but that's works. No, it's not. He is Lord. He is Savior. You can't divide it. It doesn't mean that I'm going to believe in Jesus to be saved and also I'm perfectly going to submit to His Lordship. That doesn't mean what it means. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, is that you look at the one presented in Scripture. He is Savior and Lord and you cling to Him and trust to Him and in your volition, in your heart, you say, He is Lord, and I want to now follow Him. And then when you fail at following Him, you confess. But you still acknowledge Him as Lord, even though you see yourself as weak and pitiful. <laughs> another thing I want you to see that's another text that just blows that away. Go to John chapter 1, just quickly. Verse 11, John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Now, the indication here, it is twofold. There could be both ideas. That's very common with John. But we know that principally he's talking about the Jews. The Jews were his own. They were his own people. At the same time, it could also encompass the whole world. But the whole idea in here, he came to the Jews. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, if you know anything about the time of Jesus, who were the Jews waiting for? The Messiah. 
Was the Messiah Savior? Yes. What else was he? He was king. He was king. Do you see that? He was king. Absolute sovereign. Who could do anything he wanted. Remember, we will not have this man rule over us. Do you see? To receive Jesus as Savior is to receive him as Lord. As Lord. Now, go back to Romans just quickly, and I want to show you something. It says in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Many people say this, that especially in the United States, you come forward during an evangelistic campaign, you receive Jesus by praying a prayer, and then you turn around and tell the whole congregation, I confess Jesus. And that's what they think this is talking about. Or that somehow to be saved, we must believe and confess. You have to understand the text. It's not teaching those things. It's not teaching the sinner's prayer. What is it teaching? Paul goes throughout, goes, takes great care in the book of Romans to say we're only saved by faith. Is he adding to it now confession? What is he talking about? We're justified by faith. Here is what he's saying. Remember, Jesus is Lord. Who in the Roman Empire was Lord? Caesar is Lord. What is Paul teaching? He says, if you believe in your heart, if you truly trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, you're saved. And the great evidence that you have truly believed in your heart unto salvation is that you will confess him as Lord, even if it costs you your life. See how we twisted the scriptures to make it say something it never was meant to say? Let me give you an idea of what, what Paul is saying. We're all, let's say, we're all carpenters and we're working in Rome and we're, we're, we're in with a bunch of unbelievers and it's lunchtime. And we're out there eating on a hill outside of the building that we're building. And all of a sudden, we hear boom, boom, boom. And we start to tremble. And we look up and here's a group of Roman soldiers coming and they're carrying an altar with a flame on it and a bowl of incense. And all the, everybody gets up, the unbelievers get up, they go over there, they got no problem, they take a little bit of incense and they throw it in the fire and they go, Caesar is Lord. And then one of our church, they force him up there. He's one that never seemed to really walk as he should walk. One that was always causing division in the church. And he looks like this and he goes, takes some incense and throws it in the fire. Caesar is Lord. And he walks away. Doesn't even look at us. And then they hit one of us in the back with a, the back of a spear. Push us up there. And a dear brother in Christ. They say, confess Caesar is Lord. Kyrios Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And they kill him. And they throw another one of us up there. Jesus is Lord. And they kill him. And they throw another one of us up there. Jesus is Lord. That's what he's saying. And you see how evangelicals have twisted this? That that's what it means to receive Jesus. Just pray a prayer and then turn around and confess it to the church. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about salvation by faith and the evidence of that faith is you'll confess him even if it costs you your life. Now, just because we're on this subject, let's run over really quick to the book of Revelation. Chapter 3. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, before I look at this passage, I want to tell you that there are, Spurgeon included, has used this text as an illustration of receiving Christ. But because their theology was so good, it was an appropriate illustration. But this text is used today in the most horrible way to deceive people. 
And this is what basically happens. It says, well, look, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart right now. It says, if you hear his voice, do you hear his voice? Well, yeah, I, okay. Then all you have to do is open up the door and ask him to come in, and he'll come in. Do you want to do that right now? Well, sure. Well, how do I do it? Well, just pray and ask him to come in. Well, I feel uncomfortable. I, I don't really know how to pray. All right, I'll, 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 you repeat the words after me. Okay. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a Savior. Dear Jesus, I, I, dear Jesus, I know you're the Savior. Dear Jesus, I know you're the Savior. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart. Please come into my heart. Amen. And then the Christian says, did he come into your heart? And the unbeliever, or, and the person oftentimes says this, I, I don't know. And then the, then the Christian says, of course he came into your heart. He promised if you asked him, he would come into your heart. He did come into your heart. And you need to stand on that by faith. Do you see how that's twisting scripture? That's not right, brothers. That's not right at all. No, it's not right. Listen, when someone gets saved, you won't have to tell them they're saved. They will tell you. You won't have to bear witness to the Spirit that's inside them when they cannot bear witness to the Spirit. It doesn't say that in the... In the person who leads people to the Lord, the Spirit of God will cry out, Abba, Father, for another person. It says the person in whom the Spirit dwells will cry out, Abba, Father. These are terrible things that we've done. Now let's just look at the text for a minute. First of all, the context is not evangelism and it's not a sinner. The context is Jesus is knocking on the door of the church of Laodicea. A church that shut him out and it's looking in the wrong direction. That's why he says, behold, turn your attention over here. So, he's, so be very careful when you take a passage that, that is out of context. You're taking it out of context. But let's see how we can use it as an illustration. I stand at the door and knock. Is Jesus calling men through the gospel? He's calling all men through the gospel. Every time the gospel is preached, Jesus is calling everyone who can hear it. That's true. He is. He's calling. He's calling through the gospel. Now, we can talk all day about general and specific calls and everything else, but I don't think it's necessary. We all agree that when the gospel is being preached, Jesus Christ is calling men to come to him, every person who hears it. Now, Let's go on. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. All day long, God said, I hold out my hands to an obstinate people. All day long. He did it to Israel. He does it today. He's doing it over this country. He's doing it over my country. All day long. It's the judgment of God when he says enough is enough and he retracts his hands. But he's, he's calling. He says, if anyone hears my voice, that's true. <laughs> if anyone hears, really listens Listen unto obedience. If anyone will do that, he'll not cast out anyone who comes to him. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Yes, my dear friend. Paul, I, I, I heard you really believe in the sovereignty of God. I do. I also believe men must make a decision. Men must repent. Men must believe. They must. Men must act. What must I do to be saved? You must do something. I do believe undergirding that is the power of God, the regenerating work of the Spirit, and all sorts of other things. But I will not deny, and no one can, that if you're going to be saved, you must make a decision. You must repent. You must believe. You must act upon these words. And not just sit there passively. Behold, I stand at the door. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come into him. Anyone, anyone comes to Jesus, he will not cast them out. He will not. He will come in and dine, and he will, and will dine with him and he with me. Now, there's two points I want to make out. Let's imagine that all of a sudden, you know, just like these preachers preach today, 
they, they give this illustration. You're in your house. And your house is just destroyed. Your house is horrible. Your house is just, it's just a place of death and destruction. And you're at the end of your ropes. And there's nothing that you can do. And then all of a sudden, Jesus knocks on the door. Okay. I'll follow it up to that point. And they'll say, and you just open that door and Jesus will come in. Now let me change that a little. You run over there thinking, man, I'm going to get my house cleaned up. I'm going to get a better life and everything else. I can't wait. But right before you turn that door handle, on the other side, you hear Jesus clear his voice. <clears throat> before you touch that door handle, you need to understand something. You open that door, I'll come in. But I come in as Lord. And when I come in, I own that and that and that. I own the house. I own you. I own everything. Do you understand me? When I come in, I come in as Lord. That changes things. And now look at this also. The evidence that Jesus has come into your life, he dines with you and you with him. Now what does that mean? The evidence that you have truly received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is your ongoing fellowship with Him. How come they always leave that out? Remember what He said, depart from me. I never knew you. I never talked to you. You never walked with me. We didn't fellowship together. Depart from me, you who call yourself my disciple but lived as though I never gave you a law to obey. Do you see? You can use this text as an illustration if you use it correctly. And even then, be careful because, again, he's writing to a church, a wayward church. But you see how you can take text and think you're doing the right thing when, in fact, you're twisting Scripture. All right, back to 1 Corinthians 15. He says, which also you received, in which also you stand. You stand. What is the, the, the idea is, is this. That my standing before God is only by faith in Christ. It's only by this gospel message. It's also the idea of conviction. I, I have believed this message. I have received this message with great conviction. I stand upon Christ and his gospel as my only hope. If anyone came to me and even suggested, or if anyone came to any true Christian and even suggested that that Christian was going to heaven because of some good thing he did, the Christian would vomit. The Christian would be nauseous. No, no, no. I am going to heaven not upon my own virtue or my own merit. I go to heaven standing upon the virtue and the merit of another, Jesus Christ my Lord. Nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross of Christ I cling. Not unto us, not unto us, but to you be the glory. If one thing, if there was one thing Jonah was convinced of when he came out of the belly of that whale, salvation is of the Lord. Because there's no way he's coming out of that belly except 100% a work of God. Salvation is of the Lord. See, that's why a Christian is the only religion. It's the only religion whereby a person can say, I'm going to heaven and not be boasting. Because he's going to heaven based upon the work of another. It is his God who has saved him. It is his God that has saved him. Don't you just sometimes just, you, almost, you just want to boast about Jesus so much and there's no words to use. You just want, it's just Him. It's just Him. It's just Jesus. Just lift up Christ and there's just nothing that can be said. There's no word good enough. 
And if anyone even mentions you in the equation, you just want to say, depart from me. No. It's such a blessing to look at my children at times if they say, you know, Dad, today we had a really good time, or this was wonderful, or thank you for doing this, Dad. And it's so wonderful to tell them, son, before I knew Jesus, I was a monster. And the only reason your dad is the way he is, if he's anything right now, it's because of the Lamb of God who shed his blood in the place of your dad. All unto him. All, all glory unto him. Now, he goes, which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. Let me ask you a question. I'd like to ask this to most of the TV evangelists. So when is it that salvation became no longer enough? I think if I was a lost person again and one of these TV preachers came to me and started promising me prosperity and my best life now and healing and all kinds of other things, I would look at him and I would say, your Jesus must be pretty small if you've got to add all these other minor things to try to convince me. Is he not special enough just in himself that you've got to add all these other things about blessings and everything else or I'm not going to come? Isn't that pitiful? Don't try to coax me with little tiny things that matter nothing. When you become a Christian, a true Christian, Jesus is enough. Sometimes, you know, I just want to look at Christians and say, aren't you just happy you're not going to hell? Isn't that enough? I mean, I'm not going to hell. I should be in hell even now as I speak. I'm not going to hell. If he never did another thing for me throughout the full course of my life or eternity, I ought to be ecstatic. I'm not going to hell. We're saved. Why are you so happy? I'm saved. Yeah, but man, you're suffering and you've got this problem and that problem and your body's racked with pain and all these other things. Why are you happy? I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm not in the bondage of sin that I was once in. I'm saved. I was a monster. He made me into a human being. I'm saved. That's why if we end up Spending the end of our life, which is more than likely, in prison. We still have enough to worship him 24 hours a day. We're saved. He says, by which you are saved. And now look at this. If you're saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, now what does this mean? I know that there is a debate, probably even among many of you, about believers falling away or this or that. But I will tell you this. Those of you who believe that a believer can fall away, you need to hear at times great and precious promises from God about the security of the believer. And if there's those of you here today who believe in the security of the believer, you need to hear this. And what is it? That if you think that one time in your life you made a decision, asked Jesus to come in and he saved you, and then after a few years of a little bit of interest you totally fell away from everything that has to do with Christ and God and you're just a nominal Christian and you really don't care, but that's okay because you're saved, don't think that. Because one thing that we all know, whichever side you're on, is this. The evidence of salvation is you're going to persevere. You're going to continue. You're going to continue believing. You're going to continue repenting. That is true. And remember what I said. The evidence that one time you repented years ago and were saved is that you're still repenting today. 
And the evidence that one time long ago you believed and Christ saved you is you're still believing today. But if one time many years ago you repented and believed and then you just fell totally away from all of this and you never went on and bore fruit and you didn't continue on in the faith, don't sit there right now with all your security. You need to examine yourself, check yourself to make sure. You need to examine yourself in light of Scripture. Because again, the evidence of justification is ongoing sanctification. Whichever way you look at this. And he goes on and he says, verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now tomorrow, we're going to talk about the Gospel in depth for the next couple of days, hopefully. But there's one more point that I want to make here. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. I delivered it to you. When I have to preach, I have no, no rest the day, the day that I'm preaching. I, I don't. I'm not like, I, I just, I know people who can turn it on and shut it off and everything else. I'm just not one of those. When I know that I've got to deliver the gospel, that day is ruined for everything else. Until I finish preaching and the burden is gone. I've delivered it. It's that serious. And if I have not delivered it clearly, I'm burdened and must struggle through that. So it is a great, great burden to carry the gospel. There's no message that is greater. And, but also, he says, I delivered it to you as of first importance. The first thing Paul wanted to know about anyone was their standing in light of the gospel. The first thing he wanted to tell anyone was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that he wanted to continue teaching anyone was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you not see for yourself so many sermons behind pulpits and TVs and everything else where you could literally go for months and never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? Christ crucified, bearing our sins, paying the penalty. Suffering the wrath of God in our place. Rising from the dead. Seated at the right hand of God. Calling men to repentance and faith. It's a rare message. Don't think that Norway is gospel hardened. Norway, like my own country, is gospel ignorant. And it's gospel ignorant because many of its own preachers are gospel ignorant. Now I have looked around in this country, like in my own, and I have heard testimony of some men who still preach the gospel in this country. Either behind pulpits or in the, in the street, but there are men here who preach the gospel, like there are in mine, but so many and, and partly because of what's come out of America, so many have learned another song that is not the song of Zion. And they are preaching it. And there are large congregations that know not the gospel. We must return to the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that in this conference... Everything that we do will honor you and honor your son. That everything that we do here, Father, would give clearer light upon the gospel of your dear son. And that if there's anyone here who does not know you, that this time will be the time of their salvation. That they not tarry or wait, but repent and believe. And those that do know you, Lord... That all the vain things that charm them most, they would sacrifice to the blood of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they would put them away as useless trinkets and fix their eyes 
upon Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen.